Happy Friday, everyone. I am finally on at the time that I have always supposed to be on, uh, to have been on, which is Friday morning, but it seems like every Friday morning so far, there's been some sort of conflict and I've had to switch the time or mix it up. But this is what I'm always supposed to be on. Um, so my weekly readings are a little like I've caught up with where we've gotten to in the novel so far. Um, so in the novel, we're still on the April 4th issue. Um, and I already looked through the April 4th issue last time and kind of there wasn't a whole lot to connect it with yet. And so I just went through the structure of the magazine with you guys. Um, so today I'm going to try something a little bit different since I found that I'd um, covered more ground than Owen recently. Um, so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to read an article from the next issue. Um, that's April 11th. I'm going to read an article that goes along with a part of the novel that you haven't read yet. Okay. So I think up to chapter seven of the novel has been posted. I'm reading from the next issue, which, which starts with chapter eight. And without giving anything away, I'm going to read an article that I think is related to the events of the next installment of the novel. And I don't know, see if that gives you any hints about what's going to happen. But I actually haven't chosen the article yet. So I'm just skimming through. I just got done reviewing the plot in this issue so I could see what was going on and see if I could find anything related. As usual, it starts with a story and there's another article this week about royal wedding gifts. I guess a royal wedding was a big deal and uh, there could be more than one weekly issue about that. Uh, then there's another novel. Um, then there's a very random little paragraph about the way people eat in the Middle East. It's very odd. Um, then we get to Lady Audley's Secret. I'm not going to tell you what happens. And there's another novel. Man, it's novel heavy this time. Um, more about the royal wedding. We have the facetia section, that's just humor. Gosh, there's actually not much in this issue. It's interesting, must have been a slow news week. Um, Let's see, we'll do the miscellaneous section. Maybe there's something there that's related. Uh, miscellaneous, the London Fever Hospital in 1862 received, that would have been the year before, and this is 1863, received 20, 2,609 patients being 938 in excess of the largest number of patients received in any year. This increase was chiefly due to the prevalence of typhus fever. Since the foundation of the hospital in 1802, 31,319 patients have been admitted. Next little section in miscellaneous, intelligence of the lark. A pair of larks had built their nest in a grass field where they hatched a brood of young. Very soon after the birds were out of their nests, the owner of the field was forced to set his mowers at work, the state of the weather forcing him to cut his grass sooner than usual. As the laborers approached the nest, the parent birds seemed to take alarm, and at, least, at last the mother laid herself flat upon the ground with outspread wings and tail while the male bird took one of her young out of the nest, and by dent of pulling and pushing got it on the mother's back. She then flew with her young over the field and soon returned for another. This time the father took his turn to carry one, being assisted by the mother and getting it firmly on his back. And in this manner, they carried off the whole brood before the mowers reached their nest. 
The next little section is called eccentric people. What is called eccentricity is in nine cases out of 10, either affection or the result of mental disease. It is said of many a man who deserves to be ostracized from society for violating its proprieties. What an oddity he is. How very eccentric. Insolence, bearishness, brutal disregard of the requirements of good breeding, personal slovenliness, in fact, any marked departure from the conventional rules which govern the conduct of decent people is tolerated and often admired in persons who, by persistently and methodically ignoring the obligations of courtesy and delicacy, have obtained a reputation for eccentricity. We have no good word for nuisances of this class and no feeling except pity and contempt for those who defer to and believe in them. If a man brings the manner and habits of a savage into civilized society, he ought to be drummed out of it, if sane or put under wholesome restraint, if lunatic. The Alpine Heights. The pen and the pencil may attempt and not unsuccessfully to reproduce the soft gradations of the beautiful or the abrupt contrasts of the picturesque. But they are alike powerless and paralyzed before the awful grandeur of the Alpine Heights, where there is either, neither life nor motion, where a stern, unwilling sublimity has molded every form and stamped upon the serene the frown of a perpetual winter. There is nothing in the ordinary aspect of nature that prepares us for what we see when we have entered the regions of perpetual snow. Here is no harm of insects, no rustle hum of insects, no rustle of foliage, no pulse of vitality. There is no provision for animal life in the pitiless granite, ice, and snow that make up the landscape. The solitary eagle, whose slow circling form is painted on the dark sky above, seems like a momentary presence like ourselves and not a sense of the scene. Nature is no longer a beauty, beauteous and benevolent mother, but a stern and awful power before which we bow and tremble and the earth ceases to be man farm and garden and becomes only a part of the solar system. The next one, a light style of headdress. A new feature in the application of gas to domestic purposes is on the point of introduction in America. Clusters of dis... Sorry, it's like really uh, blurry on this part of the paper. Clusters of Dis diminutive gaslights are to spring from the elaborate tresses of beautiful matrons. So this is like they are talking about lights being in headdresses, like gas lights in your hat, which sounds really dangerous to me. But um, the jets will issue from barners measuring a 20th of an inch within transparent shades, not larger than a cherry. The tailing is to be of solid gold connected with a reservoir of the same, which is to be concealed in the luxuriant hair behind the head. The pressure will be adjusted to the golden tank, which is suppo supported by an elaborate back comb, the top of which forms a row of little gas lights. Before entering the hall room, the husband will turn on the gas, light up the blushing bride and usher her in to her sphere of conquest. The headdress is worn by the ladies at Padmerton's and all others. other assemblies are so high that they remind one of a costume ball. The present fashion among the leaders of something is to have a quality of flowers high upon the head. Oh, it's like really, really lightly like the contrast is really low it's hard to read um being photographed upon the occasion that i had the advantage of the photographer's services he placed a crown imperial in my hand which made me feel like a king of clubs and around my feet a quality of litter and dead leaves then he ran a painted screen behind me, took out his watch, and bade me be still for half a minute. For that nothing could for that nothing could be more beautiful. Something excited, enchanted by the unwanted compliment, I remained perfectly still and petrified with a stinging in my ears and a rushing of blood from all my extremities 
for the proper period, which finally resulted after about the time requisite for the reduction, for the production of a living human creature in 20 cart de vis of your humble servant sitting in a garden considered by persons to be very like only with rather a solid expression. I call it myself the fool in the flower. So he's describing, God, it's hurting my eyes to read that. He's describing getting his picture taken and a carte de vist is like, it's almost like if you could think of like making baseball cards of yourself or like business cards with a picture that like everybody would have and you could like give them to your friends when you went to visit and they, many people would like collect them in an album. Ooh, look at it. There's just one more in miscellaneous. Thank goodness. Columbus and his sailors. As the sailors of Columbus were to him in his voyage of discovery, so are our faculties to us in the endeavor of our spirit. And so to the witness for truth in his fellow man in the work which he has called them, the sailors call, where is land? And again, where is land? When the east wind blue, it seemed to the sailors an omen of fear. Will it not blow us on and on forever? So in the advance of the mind in search of the spirit and political truth and good, or even in the pursuit of science, the impulse of a great directive thought, though it is as a wind from God, his trade wind, which will conduct us to and then facilitate our intercourse with some new and now to be discovered land produces as we are advanced onward, distrust and fear. Though our faculties heartily were with us at first, and though our fellow men entered the ship of endeavor with pride and hope, now there is anger. The captain is called fool. It is asked, where is land? That was the endless, this is endless, and the sea will blow us on forever and ever. Well, I'm writing a book right now, and I can definitely say, even though I'm getting so close to the end, that's my attitude. Is it ever going to end? Is my train of thought ever going to produce something of value? God, that like really hurt my eyes. Um, Okay, I am not going to tell you what because I don't want to give it away, but one of those little quick uh, articles in the miscellaneous section uh, does have to do with um, the ultimate plot twist in our book. So I'm going to keep this one short because I think you should go back and re-listen to all of them and try to guess which one you think is relevant to our story. All right, guys, have a wonderful weekend.